Uh, we're going to talk about monitoring predictive maintenance model. It's a slightly less sexy title, uh, but a bit more, uh, you know, descriptive, hopefully. And on the agenda, we have four items. First, we're going to talk about the kind of general ML monitoring flow, so how to monitor your machine learning models that are deployed to production, and how this flow applies to predictive maintenance models, which basically is going to apply one-to-one. -one. Then we're going to talk about three specific challenges uh, that we generally face when we either deploy or we work with uh, models that are deployed to production that uh, do predictive maintenance. First is model deployment, and all the issues around model deployment. Then we're going to uh, deal with so-called sensor confusion matrix, where we actually don't have ground truth or the label data right after making the prediction. And even when we wait and we actually get the prediction, we still don't get the full confusion matrix. It's censored. We define what it is and then how we'll, how to deal with it. And we're going to talk about an algorithm that actually allows us to estimate the model performance, even if the confusion matrix is censored. And then at the end, we're going to talk about data quality, which is another kind of pervasive issues with uh, predictive maintenance models in production. And we're going to discuss kind of a toolbox that we have at our disposal of how to detect and deal with data quality issues. So let's get started with the ML monitoring flow. The first part, in general, how to monitor machine learning models. So first, uh, let's discuss why we actually need to monitor predictive maintenance models in production. So the first thing is all machine learning models have certain main business uh, ideas or business impact behind them that we want to satisfy when we deploy the model to production. And for predictive maintenance model, it's generally reducing the downtime, reducing the number of machine issues so we can maintain less of them and more efficiently. So there's going to be less machine issues and uh, the machines will be able to operate more often. Here, I'm going to be using the word machine in kind of an abstract term. It can apply to a machine that manufactures something. It can apply to, let's say, a wind turbine uh, that is manufacturing energy or producing energy. Or it can even apply to, like, let's say, a train uh, that is not manufacturing something, but it's still operating. So it's a, a it's machine and it's operation. Uh, one another thing that we want to do is we want to have full observability of model performance and also potential other things uh, to reduce the risk of machine failure. And just to give you a kind of full explanation here, machine can fail if our predictive maintenance model fails. Because if our predictive maintenance model says that you should not maintain a model uh, where it actually needs maintenance, then in extreme cases, this might actually lead to machine failure or at least machine issues, which again will have downstream impact. So it all starts with a uh, model being actually uh, performance. So we need to really monitor the performance to reduce that risk. And la last thing, more from kind of personal perspective or team perspective, less so from the organizational perspective, we want to increase the visibility of predictive maintenance impact. We want to be recognized for our work and we want to make sure that we'll be able to you know, deliver more value and rec be recognized for that. So now, in terms of the actual monitoring flow, it's quite simple. First of all, we're going to start with performance monitoring. So we're going to be monitoring either the realized performance of a model. Let's say we use ROC AUC or average precision or F-beta score, precision and recall together in some way. Uh, to evaluate the performance of the model. So we're going to be looking at the data that we get back, uh, whether it was actually needed to maintain a, a machine. Uh, but even without that information, we can immediately estimate the model performance right after we make the prediction using the algorithms we will talk about later. So first step is performance monitoring, knowing at all times what is the expected performance of your predictive maintenance model. Then if we see that there is a performance drop, we're going to go to the second part, which is the automated root cause analysis, or at least augmented root cause analysis, when we use a suite of tools at our disposal that includes concept detection, data detection, data quality issues, and then we'll be able to uh, really navigate what are the potential problems and pinpoint the hopefully one or two underlying causes that are actually responsible for drop in performance or degradation in performance. And then once we know what is the problem, we'll be able to resolve it. And here an issue resolution is quite simple. Uh, there's just kind of a simple flowchart for that. So let's talk about performance monitoring. I already briefly touched about it. It's a proxy for business impact. So whatever metric we're using, whether it's F1, precision, or actual business metric that we're able to track if we know that every hour of downtime uh, costs a certain amount of money and every time we 
should have maintained the machine, but we didn't. It costs another amount of money. And if we can put that in, we can also directly just measure that and also estimate it even without the target data. Uh, we identify potential issues, and then if there are issues, we can trigger root cause analysis. Of course, this is not easily possible without the target data or with sensor confusion matrix, where we don't have the full confusion matrix, uh, but we'll be able to estimate it anyway with performance estimation algorithms. Now, in terms of root cause analysis, it's kind of like a mini flow in itself where we start with the drift detection and data quality checks, both covariate shift detection and concept drift detection. And then we'll use those drift signals and data quality signals to kind of correlate with performance, figure out automatically when these two kind of coexist or happen at the same time, co-occur. And then we're gonna use our domain knowledge. And this is really the only manual step here when we use the domain knowledge to figure out what is the actual root cause, what is the most likely scenario? Why is our machine learning model not performing as well as it used to? And then once we have that, we can go to the third step, which is the issue resolution. And here, as I already mentioned, there's basically three main causes for performance drop. It's the covariate shift where our model input distribution changes. So the joint, probability distribution or joint distribution, empirical distribution of our model inputs changes significantly, which might lead to degradation in model performance. And if that happens, then we cannot simply retrain the model because if the data drifted to a region where it's very hard to predict, let's say close to class boundary, then retraining the model won't really help because the data is just more noisy. So then we need to adjust the prediction thresholds. And generally speaking with predictive maintenance use cases, we want to, uh, probably increase the threshold so we maintain even if it's potentially not needed to really make sure that we avoid uh, machine issues. So we're gonna sacrifice a bit of precision for recall or the other way around, I can never get them right. right. Uh, but we're gonna sacrifice a bit of precision for recall to make sure that we really protect um, the machines from having some issues and it's always maintained often enough. And that way we can still retain a big part of the business impact because uh, the, the machine will still perform very well and we will be able to still maintain it less often than on a fixed schedule. Then another issue probably that the one that happens most often is data quality. When we get, we'll use our toolbox to detect data quality issues and then we'll be able to go uh, up the pipeline either working with data engineers or potentially people who collect the data or even machine operators. Uh, that uh, will be able to help us fix the data quality issues. And then the last thing is concept drift. So change in the pattern or relationship between the model inputs and the targets and the labels. And if that happens, then indeed we need to retrain the model because what model does is captures this concept, this relationship between the features and the labels. And if that changes, we can simply retrain the model once we gather enough data. So uh, this is the flow. Now let's talk about model deployment and the issues that we will encounter there or we already have encountered there and how to resolve them with science as always. So when we want to deploy a predictive maintenance model, uh, there's a couple of real world issues uh, that are actually quite specific to predictive maintenance. The first one is deployment costs. So when we deploy the model, oftentimes, not always, but unfortunately, oftentimes, we need to deploy locally, on-premise, in multiple locations, because there's multiple factories, multiple wind farms, multiple whatever, we sometimes need to even deploy on edge, and that um, just increases the operational costs and means that we'll probably have to think twice before we say that this is actually worth it and we should deploy it. Uh, and then the second point is that flexible maintenance schedule is a significant operational change. Uh, which again carries costs, not necessarily monetary, but definitely time costs. So again, we need to be quite sure that the model will perform well in the real world before we are ready to bear those costs and before it actually makes sense from the business perspective to deploy the model. Then false negatives might have catastrophic consequences if I like wind turbines, so I'm gonna say wind turbines again, if wind turbine needs maintenance, but the model confidently and incorrectly predicts that it doesn't, uh, we can actually have uh, catastrophic consequences there where uh, there might be a potential breaking failure with a wind turbine, which is something, of course, we want to avoid at almost all costs. And then uh, we have group of issues related to trust. 
uh, where machine operators don't trust predictive maintenance models. Quite often, it's not always the case, but again, this is just a human component. So we need to build that trust. We need to be able to showcase that the model actually works well in the real world before it's deployed on a large scale or oper uh, organizational wide. Uh, then leadership tends to overestimate human expertise compared to machine learning models, even if we have the data to show otherwise. So again, we need to show that it not only works in lab conditions, but it works in the real world before uh, we are ready to deploy it across the organization. And then last thing is that the early model failure, if you deploy the model across the entire organization and it fails, it might actually damage the trust in the entire data science team or data team and in other use cases, data science use cases. So uh, unfortunately, the potential of damage or trust damage is not limited to just the use case we're working on. And then the last uh, kind of family of issues is adherence to procedures or lack of adherence to procedures, uh, where the data collection is not necessarily always very strict and uh, really paid attention to, especially when it comes to machine operators. Then uh, sometimes the model recommendations are not strictly followed. Uh, so that might mean that even if model predicts well, it's not going to have the impact that it should. Uh, because the decisions, the policies that are created based on model recommendations are not really followed strictly. And then kind of a spe special cases of the uh, the second point is that sometimes the machines will be maintained just in case, because why not, or to meet the production quota, uh, the recommended maintenance would be skipped, uh, which generally speaking it introduces a lot of risk and it's rarely worth it, but it's something that we'll have to deal with. So one way to make sure that the adherence to procedures is good enough is to uh, do so-called pilot. So work with a specific subgroup uh, or limited uh, deployment and make sure that the model actually has the impact it should have before again, deploying uh, across the entire organization. So, as I already mentioned, we're going to do a pilot, which is like a limited deployment. And why do we care about it? So first, we want to rig rigorously evaluate the performance of machine learning models in production. We want to make sure that our predictive maintenance model actually works not just in the test set, but it is able to deal with a potential testing servings queue, potential data drift that happens immediately after we deploy it, and just real life conditions. Maybe latency is different, maybe data quality is actually much worse than on our training data. All that kind of stuff is something that we have to bear with uh, and identify, hopefully fix. And the way to do it is to run a pilot. Then we want to also ensure that not only the actual uh, machine learning metrics are good, but the business KPIs uh, and potential guardrail metrics around the KPIs are within specifications that we're actually having the business impact that we're expecting to have. And then uh, as kind of last goal, we want to design this pilot in a way that minimizes the time uh, and the work needed to reach the number one and number two. So we want to ensure uh, that the business impact is there and that machine learning models actually perform well as fast as possible. How do we do it? So, as I already mentioned twice this time, uh, we're gonna run a pilot. Pilot means just deploying a model in a limited way. Maybe in one location, one group of machines uh, will need enough to be representative. So we want a representative group or representative location. Uh, but it still needs to be limited. So if something goes wrong, we can just look at it uh, from kind of impartial perspective with limited downsides, of course, also limited upsides to really validate that this model is ready for real world. And what we're going to do there, we're going to deploy the model and uh, we're going to measure the model performance. We're going to make sure that the policies are in place based on what the model predicts to maintain uh, a machine or not. And we're going to make sure that the predictive maintenance, sorry, the maintenance schedule is followed based on the uh, predictions from our machine learning model. Then we're gonna also measure the business KPIs based on that uh, flexible maintenance schedule. And also we're gonna measure as kind of a control group. So we're actually gonna run a bit of an experiment here, the business KPIs for machines not using the model. So there will be a control group when we will not be using machine recommendations. We can still make predictions for those machines, but we will not be using those recommendations in the real world. And hopefully we see uh, that recommended actions uh, have a positive impact on the downtime 
and machine issues. And then to do that, we're gonna use the pilot evaluation framework, which is a framework we designed together with industry partners uh, to evaluate pilots quickly and efficiently. Now, how does it work? So this is gonna be kind of a mouthful, so bear with me here. What we're gonna start with is that we have certain uh, model performance we observed on the test data. But because of noise in the data and the stochastic nature of the world that we're operating in, we cannot just put, say that it's one specific number. And if uh, model performance on the test set is even a tiny bit worse than that, then uh, we're dealing with model degradation. So instead of that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Bayesian statistics to estimate, we're gonna treat the model performance as a random variable, and we're gonna estimate uh, the probability density function of where that uh, variable lies. We're gonna do it on the test set and on our uh, pilot data. And then, so it's gonna be our evaluation posterior. So we're gonna get two posteriors where the model performance lies, the evaluation posterior, which is the pilot one, and the reference. We're gonna also define so-called region of practical equivalence, which is these lines here, the red lines, and they're gonna tell us what is an acceptable range. And then we're gonna see whether our evaluation posterior is within that range or not. That's the kind of very high level intuition behind it. Uh, now, how to do it, uh, step by step. First, we're gonna define our key performance metrics, uh, KPMs, similar to KPIs, but here we're specifically focusing on machine learning metrics. Uh, so let's say that we really care about F1. Then we're gonna define our regions of practical equivalence. Uh, what is region of practical equivalence? I mean, it's in the name, right? So it's a region when we say that the model performance is practically equivalent for all our purposes. So we can say here, for example, that F1 is between one and 0 0.945, which would be an excellent performance unachievable for a predictive maintenance model, but just as an example. And then, uh, once we have that row, so we define what we expect the model, what do we expect to see in terms of model performance, it might be based on the uh, our test set. And in that case, it's optional. If it's done automatically, uh, it's going to just be uh, most of uh, where the uh, test set performance lies, plus a bit of leeway. So maybe there's some stochastic effects and model performance drops a bit, but we're still fine with that. Uh, and then once we define that, we can start the pilot, we wait for the results, and then hopefully uh, we profit and the model goes to production, not only in one location, but everywhere. Now, so we've been running this pilot. How do we know where to stop, whether we can say that the model performance is satisfactory or not? So to conclude the pilot, uh, we will again look at the same plots. These are always the same plots. And we're gonna look at two things. First, we want to make sure that this distribution is small enough. So we want to gather enough data to make sure that some random effects, lucky or un unlucky runs, don't really influence the results and we don't uh, finish the pilot too early getting the wrong conclusion. So we're gonna wait until the width of the distribution is small enough. And here, to be a bit more specific, instead of looking at the entire distribution, we're gonna look at the region where 95% of total probability mass lies. This is called the highest density interval. Uh, the short term for that is HDI or the abbreviation. Uh, so we're gonna look at 95% HDI for let's say precision here, and we're gonna make sure that it is small enough. Uh, this is again, the width of that is determined automatically. So it's not something that you have to manually specify, although you can if you want. And then once this width is specified, the only thing we're gonna do is we're gonna wait, we're gonna gather more and more data, more and more predictions. And again, remember you can also predict on the control group, so you gather more predictions. And then uh, once we have enough of those predictions, uh, we'll be able to say uh, whether the actual uh, random variable, which is precision of our predictive maintenance algorithm here, the KPM lies within the region of practical equivalence within the red lines or outside of it. And here we see that as we get 30,000 predictions, uh, the HDI, so highest density interval drop outside of rope. And then we can say that model performance is outside of the region that's acceptable for us. And we can say that the pilot is going to be not successful. 
And then alternatively here, the same thing, but we see that immediately uh, there is very strong performance in, in, in terms of accuracy. And we already know immediately after we put the first batch of data, which is let's say 7,000 points, that the model performs very well. And we can already accept uh, that metric, that this metric is good enough and accuracy is within specified region. And then sometimes if we are not very lucky, uh, we might have this kind of straddling issue here where the model performance is right around uh, the bottom part of the rope. And uh, what you also see here is that it's slightly below the reference posterior, but not really strongly. And in that case, we need to take kind of a second look and ask ourselves, are we ready to keep on gathering more data? Or should we reevaluate our evaluation criteria? Maybe we're actually happy if model performance drops to a recall of 0 0.84. In that case, we can adjust it. Of course, that means that we are changing our experiment design, but good news about this compared to typical, so good news about Bayesian evaluation compared to typical frequentist approach is that picking doesn't really ruin anything. You can actually pick, peak, and it's all fine. You shouldn't change your experiment design, but if you design a different experiment, you can still use the same data and say that, yes, if we are actually happy with recall of 0 0.84, then, and this actually fulfills all the business requirements, then the model performance would be within specified region. Or if we say that, no, we really need to be above that, then we can say that this is still a failure. All right, and now, uh, we can specify one or more key performance metrics. So here you will just see kind of an overview of how it would look in practice when we have automatically or manually specified rope. Uh, we see what is the current level of HDI, so the actual distribution. And then we know whether uh, what was the status. So whether the pilot is still ongoing for that metric, uh, whether it's been the hypothesis that the model performance in production is not lower or within rope. Um, has been rejected, it's ongoing, so still unknown or accepted. Now, that's the first part. We dealt with the machine learning metrics. Now, how do we deal with the business KPIs? In a very similar way, so we're going to define the business KPI or multiple business KPIs, and we're going to define the region of practical equivalence where we want this business KPI to lie. So again, we're going to treat it as a random variable. And here, unfortunately, we have to specify it manually because there is no way to say what's well, like a default good region of practical equivalence for an arbitrarily specified business KPI. And then we start the pilot and here it goes. In terms of typical business KPIs, I wanna go a bit more specific here because we're talking about predictive maintenance in the end. Uh, there's five that I've seen so far. There might be some others. But the big five are the downtime. So we want to reduce the downtime. So we want to keep the downtime as low as possible. Uh, then we have mean time between failures, which is like a very typical metric that's used to uh, evaluate predictive maintenance schedules um, and the machines themselves and machine operators and basically everything. Uh, then product quality for machines that produce things if you are in manufacturing, uh, then product quality. Then volume, whether it's product volume for things that manufacture other things or energy volume, uh, if you're dealing with energy production, uh, that's another thing. Um, and then the last thing is returns, again, coming back to manufacturing. Uh, this is kind of the ultimate uh, test of product quality. If there's customer returns from that specific location, it means that the product quality is actually lower than it should be. And it's in a way that's unacceptable, generally speaking. So again, just an example, uh, let's say that we have here purchases, we're running the pilot here based on um, specific new way of maintaining the model. And we see here that actually the purchases have increased because maybe uh, it's some kind of uh, SaaS when you get, you know, every uh, month you get a new razor blade and the razor blades are actually better. So people are starting to buy more. Um, this is kind of a, like a stretch example, but it's something that could happen. Let's say we're working with a razor blade company. It's just an example. Now, uh, in terms of uh, real world issues, let's kind of circle back to what we discussed in the beginning, the issues that we stated. So first, deployment costs. Uh, well, how do we know if deployment costs are bearable? We can say that it's a go if the expected value of our ROI, however we define it, the business KPIs, 
is significantly higher than deployment costs because of course there's always maintenance, always issues. So it needs to be really much higher than deployment costs, which generally speaking should be the case if the pilot is successful. Then in terms of trust, if we see that the model performance is within the rope and we can actually kind of externalize the model evaluation to an impartial framework that just does its own thing and it says that all metrics are fine, then this actually tends to increase trust and especially within business stakeholders, but also with machine operators. And then the last thing in terms of adherence to procedures, uh, we just want to ensure that there is no negative impact on product quality slash volume um, or potentially other business KPIs, but I think it's mostly about product quality and volume of whatever we're producing here with our machines. Um, so that is the last part that solves kind of the last issue that we had. So this is the pilot evaluation framework. Now we can move to the third part, actually, which is the sensor confusion matrix. So we managed to actually deploy our model uh, organization-wide. It works on all the machines. It does the predictive maintenance for all the machines. And what is the next issue that we'll have to deal with? So the issue is that we take it our model inputs, we make the prediction, uh, and then once we make the prediction, there's certain policy that's followed and that has an impact on machine uptime, hopefully positive, impact on machine issues, hopefully negative, it decreases machine issues. And then after that, uh, we get access to some targets. And the problem is that if we wait for the targets, uh, actually, if something breaks, we're gonna have negative impact on machine uptime or potentially at the same time, also uh, increase a number of machine issues. So this is something that we actually want to avoid. So if possible, we want to catch model failure before there is impact on the real world. And this is something that we can actually do. Um, and just to mention, we never have targets before it is too late, before there is actually impact on the real world. So ideally we want to stop it before there's any significant impact on machine uptime and machine issues and all the other business KPIs, of course. So once we have the targets, Unfortunately, we still don't get all the targets. So now uh, it's a predictive maintenance use case. So it's a binary classification, make the prediction whether a machine is normal or machine will fail. Whatever fail means here. Maybe there's some kind of checks that we expect to see fail. Uh, maybe it's an actual issue. Maybe there is a person who would normally come in and say whether the machine needs uh, uh, needs maintenance, maybe there's some kind of automated or semi-automated or manual test that is done and we're using machine learning to, do, uh, to instead of that test, whatever it is, we say that we need to do uh, maintenance. So if we predict that machine operation is normal and no uh, maintenance is needed, then we actually get the target data. We'll get the labels because if machine fails, whatever is the definition of failure here, uh, we're going to know it. And if it doesn't, we're also going to know it. However, if we predict that the machine fails and then we follow the policy we established, which is we do maintenance, and then we see that the machine actually did not fail, we will never know whether it's due to the fact that we actually maintained the machine and our prediction was correct. It would have failed had we not maintained it or whether the maintenance was actually not necessary and the machine was operating fine either way and we just wasted time doing maintenance. So we actually never did get those targets for all the machines that uh, actually use the policies based on model recommendations, which is a problem. So then we need to be able to do some kind of estimation for model performance without the target data. And this is something that's possible with the algorithms we developed here at NaniML. And to be a bit more precise here, we can calculate basically any metric that you want uh, that deals with predictive maintenance use cases. So it's confusion matrix itself, any metrics that stem from the confusion matrix, precision, recall, accuracy, specificity of one, blah, blah, blah. Uh, also the metrics that are combinatoric, the combinatorial, one of those two, uh, which is okay, you see average precision. And then last thing, if we can attach actual specific value to each of the types of false positive, false negative, et cetera. So all the elements of confusion matrix, we can then also estimate the business impact which normally is not possible to do very, very precisely, but we have a general idea of how much does it cost if we do maintenance that was not needed versus if we do uh, maintenance that, um, if we don't do maintenance that actually uh, was needed. 
So in terms of the inputs, what do we actually need to run that algorithm? First, we need to have the predicted probabilities. Uh, we also need the model predictions. And for our test set and test set only, so this model is also going to train another model that's going to be fit on the test set. And for that, we also need the targets there. But we do not need the targets after the model goes into production. And then we can uh, do CBP, or there is also a better algorithm that is available at NaniML right now, but I'm going to focus on CBP just because it's slightly simpler. We're going to take model predictions and predict probabilities. We're going to calibrate those predicted probabilities. And I'm going to explain in a second what calibration means. Uh, and then once we know that the predicted probabilities are calibrated, so they are actually true probabilities, according to frequency definition of what probability is, we are able, and this is kind of the magic step, to find the expected confusion matrix for every point, for every prediction we make, for every machine at every data point. And then we can get aggregate confusion matrix per chunk. So we're going to aggregate it for location for a given day or for all the locations for a given day or maybe for a week, however often we make predictions. Uh, and then we can use that confusion matrix as kind of a starting point to estimate or to calculate uh, any other metric we want. So uh, how does it actually work kind of step by step? So we're going to start with confusion matrix. And let's say that we make a positive prediction. Then we already know something. We already know that this prediction is not negative, obviously. So we can put zeros in false negative and true negative. Kind of obvious, right? Then we also know that this uh, prediction returned predicted probability of 0 0.7. And now assuming, and that's a really a huge assumption, that this predictive probability is actually true. So there is actually 70% chance that this data point is going to turn out to be positive. We can then say that in expectation, and there is 70% chance that it's going to be a true positive and 30% chance it's going to be a false positive. So in expectation, just write 0 0.7, 0 0.3. And we have our instance level confusion matrix for every prediction we make. We keep on doing that for the second prediction, and I'm going to just keep on adding all the instance level confusion matrices together. And then once we have enough data points, in practice we need, let's say, a few hundred data points at least, uh, we can estimate, for example, accuracy here, just using typical definition of what accuracy is. And we see we expect 70% uh, accuracy based on these three data points. This is really the algorithm. It's uh, it's kind of magical that at first seems completely impossible, and then when you're here, it seems trivial. But there is one big issue, which is these predicted probabilities are not actually 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. So we cannot just assume that the number that our classifier outputs is actual predicted probability. So uh, this is something that I'm going to leave for later. But now let's just uh, bear that, that we need to calibrate those. Uh, we need to make sure that they are adjusted in a way that the 0 0.7 actually on average represents 70% chance that a model and uh, that the prediction is going to be positive. Uh, and then there's also additional issues, uh, but uh, I can send you docs later on when we explain the details and also our upcoming paper about how it actually works. In the meantime, let me present you the results. And one very interesting uh, thing here that I think uh, is going to be new for a lot of people, which is that covariate shift doesn't need to be there, doesn't need to be strong to actually experience a strong drop in performance. And what you see on the left side here is a measure of multivariate data drift. So we capture the changes in the global data structure uh, using like a compressor and decompressor algorithm. And we see that uh, the metric that we use, the PCA reconstruction error, so we're just using PCA to compress and decompress data, and we measure how well it reconstructs uh, the actual data, the actual model inputs. We see it's reasonably stable, it doesn't go really that high. It's definitely within like automated thresholds that we see, nothing unusual, and continues to be quite okay. But if we look at estimated and realized accuracy, more importantly, we see that there is a very strong dip here in January 2017, something that would definitely be concerning. We would expect definitely more uh, machine learning, uh, sorry, machine failures or uh, more downtime looking at this performance. So this is something we definitely need to look into, uh, even though there is no covariate shift. So covariate shift is not only a 
not only deals with a lot of false positives when you see a lot of false alerts, but you might also have false negatives when the coverage shift says it's all fine, but you actually are experiencing performance drop. So now uh, the last part, quite short, we're gonna talk about the uh, data quality. So data quality is kind of the uh, main reason why machine learning was actually failing production. Uh, sometimes it's just pure coverage that just objectively happens, but not often for predictive maintenance use cases, uh, unless we deploy in new regions, new types of machines, etc. But assuming that this doesn't happen, data quality is one of really main reasons. So here we're gonna say that we experience performance drop, uh, so we have to start doing automated or augmented root cause analysis. And again, uh, there is this kind of quick workflow here when I'm going to need to run drill detection checks, data checks. I'm going to correlate those with performance and use the main knowledge. Now, just to zoom out very quickly, because we're slowly running out of time on the, the first part, which is what are the actual drill detection and data checks that we can do? So this is our toolbox. And I'm going to give you a very quick explanation of how we can use those, all of these to actually focus on detecting data quality issues. So the first part, the obvious one, we have um, two quite simple checks for data quality. When you have categorical features and there is new kind of category, uh, you can detect that. And then if that happens, it's most likely just data quality issue. It's not that there is a legitimate new kind of category that was never observed in the training data. Uh, somebody uh, probably mistyped uh, an, an entry or a sensor failed or something like that. Uh, the same goes with missing data. If you experience sensor failure, which is, uh, again, one of the reasons, I'm not sure if main reasons, but maybe of data quality issues. If you have sensor failure, maybe it will stop sending data. You get a lot of missing data. Maybe there's pipelines uh, that broke. Maybe there is some kind of manual process uh, that uh, is involved in moving the data from um, the factory floor or wherever your machine operates to the actual machine learning model and that process broke and we have a lot of missing data. So that's one way of detecting data quality issues, just directly looking at things that are related to that. Another one uh, that's quite interesting is univariate drift detection. So you can use uh, methods for both categorical features and continuous features like Jensen-Shannon distance or Wasserstein distance or KS test or chi-square test, even though generally speaking, the distance-based measures are a bit more robust uh, to detect First of all, outliers in terms of the uh, in uh, for Wasserstein distance and general changes in distribution. So if you see a very strong and especially very abrupt change in the distribution of one of the features, it is very likely that it's not actually just drift in the population, uh, but it's an actual change due to data quality. Imagine that your data used to be centered using, we also have simple statistics when you could look at the mean and your data used to be centered at, let's say 10, and now it's centered at 100. And it means that probably either in data processing or in data entry, somebody added a zero. So again, this is a way to uh, use univariate drift detection to find uh, issues. And the Wasserstein distance specifically is very, very sensitive to outliers. So if you start experiencing way more outliers than before, uh, then it's probably a data quality issues and the Wasserstein distance is really good at catching those. Then we have multivariate drift detection when we have the data reconstruction error that you saw recently. And we also have a new algorithm called domain classifier that allows you to automatically detect changes in data structure. And why it's useful for data quality? Mainly because sometimes what happens is the distributions themselves will stay roughly okay, but maybe uh, there's gonna be a shift in rows between one column and the other, and the correlation between features will change significantly. And that implies change in data structure. So both the data reconstruction error and domain classifier will be able to capture that change. And if you see that there is very strong change in correlation uh, between features by just looking at how strongly these two measures spike, you'll be able to figure out that there is a data quality related issue. So again, we're looking at very sudden changes, very abrupt changes. And then the last thing is concept drift. So the change in the relationship between your model inputs and the targets. Again, we have an algorithm that we also developed called reverse concept drift. And that allows you to estimate the magnitude of concept drift and also its impact on model performance. And there, if you see that again, you experience sudden concept drift, 
then uh, probably there's something wrong either in terms of recording the labels, uh, maybe the labels are not recorded properly anymore, or in terms of uh, recording the features, because if relationship breaks, it's very rare that in like physics informed systems, uh, you experience very strong concept drift.